Arlene Field, and she's the assistant director of our university library, which is great. Next, we have Dr. J.R. Huswit, who is the dean of arts and humanities. And then we have Chris Cronin, who's associate professor of political science. And then we have Dr. Deb Mor uh, Morris, sorry about that, I want to say Murray, but that's not right. <laughs> Dr. Deb Morris, who is the academic coordinator of our physician's assistant program. And moderating tonight is Dr. Kevin Swiss, who is the chair of our mass communications department here, who teaches this subject in his classes. So let's go ahead and just welcome. Kevin Swift. I'm chair of the uh, Department of Mass Communications, and my background is in news. So if you are not a fan, then I can be the bad guy. Uh, but my background uh, is in writing, producing, on air and off. And I, pre I uh, wrote and produced for radio and television. So uh, I've got a lot of experience with this. I've written a lot of stories and uh, seen a lot of interesting situations. Fake news is an issue that we have. We have a problem with fake news. There is real fake news out there. There are people making up stories and posting them on mostly social media. Uh, mostly young people trying to make money. They're doing this and the public is believing it. We can talk about media literacy later, but uh, this is a real issue with real fake news and people making stories up. And then we have part two with politicians. Uh, trying to get everyone to believe that everything, every story that's not positive about them is fake news. And they're using this. They've never liked the press. Uh, we can go back hundreds of years. Uh, they've, we've never been popular with them, as we've talked about in class. Uh, and now we have a third wrinkle in the whole thing on the university level, and that's that our students have to do writing and research and sort through fake news. When I was in college, there wasn't such a thing. If we went to a newspaper to source something, uh, it was a real newspaper, at least 99.9% .9 of the time. I mean, we knew if there was uh, some underground kind of uh, paper or something like that. But uh, now, these students have to sort through all things that might be fake. The idea of getting a paperback from one of my professors and having a source circle saying, this is fake, this is fake news. That did not exist way back when, when I was an undergrad. So we need to identify what is real. How do you find real sources? How do you find real news? What's reliable, despite what politicians may say? Uh, what are reliable sources? What can you count on? What can you go with in terms of your writing and research? And there are many angles to this, but um, we're going to take a look at it. So I'll turn things over to our panel and start with Arlene Fields. Well, good evening. Uh, is this on? Is it, is it help? Hopefully yeah. it helps a little bit. Yeah. All right, again, I'm Arlene Fields. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Hopefully by the end of the time you'll be a little enlightened and empowered. And uh, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of my take on what fake news is and isn't. And there's a lot of different ways that you could categorize information. Um, we all have a relationship with information, and that relationship status, it's complicated. <laughs> so, here are some ways to navigate that really rocky relationship. And again, I've divided the types of information into four different types. There are lots of different ways you can do it. I'm sure the panelists later will probably have some different perspectives as well. So, to me, fake news in and of itself is pretty limited. I think it's stuff this pretty much clickbait is trying to drive your eyeballs to advertising on some website. Um, for a lot of people, the motive is profit, not politics. They don't care what's happening as long as they generate some ad revenue. So another type of fake news could be satire sites like The Onion. So for example, like, former hippies put in horrible position of rooting for the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of true, but it, it's satire. It's meant to entertain. Um, and when you look at a headline, it makes you go, wait, what? Then you need to think about what kind of source it is. 
So second thing is misinformation. And say I send out a, a put out a tweet or a message on my friends and say, ooh, there's a rally next Saturday at the market house, you need to be there. And then somebody's like, uh, actually this Saturday. And it's like, oh, okay, my bad, sorry. Um, but then there's also disinformation. So it's like, maybe I don't want these people rallying down at the market house. So I say, hey, the rally is next Saturday. And it's actually this Saturday. But I want as many people as possible to get the date wrong and miss it. So difference there, you know, sometimes it's an honest mistake. Sometimes you are really trying to mess up the system. The fourth aspect is something that you're going to come across more often, and that's biased information. And that's hard to um, decipher, sometimes hard to pick out the bias. So one example of that is say there are two organizations, one conservative and one more liberal, that fact checks um, Donald Trump's State of the Union address last week. Now theoretically, they could all come to the same conclusions about which facts are verifiable and which aren't. But each site is only going to present those facts that support their argument. And so that's where, um, as Dr. Swift said, information literacy, critical thinking, those sorts of things come in. And there are a few ways that you can um, look for that kind of bias. And again, this is a really fast overview. You know, this is a whole course of information literacy, five minutes. Um, but a few things to think about is like, first, ask yourself the reporter's questions. Who wrote it? When was it written? Why was it written? Where, you know, is it talking about the United States or someplace else in the world? Um, and how is information disseminated? Then look for emotionally laden words. If you see outrageous tyranny, panic, snowflake, triggered, crazy, bonkers, rather terrible, hateful, unhinged, or terrible, those could be some red flags. There's a lot of exclamation points, there's some profanity that can also tell you that. This story is supposed to appeal to your emotions, um, not your intellect. Make sure you have a list of go-to trusted or vetted sources, things that have a track record for reliability and trustworthiness. Uh, some people may argue about what these sources are and aren't, but generally there are some sources in the middle that most people who are rational thinking people uh, can agree on. And last, but definitely not least, depend on the library databases. You know, you have the <laughs> library in there somewhere. Uh, because the information in our databases has pretty much gone through three different review processes. First, the publishers of the publications included, for the most part, have some editorial control. And they decide, yes, this is worthy to be in this publication. And then the database vendors say, hey, OK, these publications are, are worthy to be in the database. And then the librarians say, hey, this is a good database, so we're going to buy it. So that is your um, tuition money at work, too. Just so you know, the library spends about $200,000 a year on these databases and electronic resources. And while Google Scholar has its place, you know, the library is, is the place to go. And speaking of the library, on the library webpage, we have a list of LibGuides, Guide to Library Resources. And there is one called Fake News. And most of what I've covered here, plus some additional resources, is there. And I encourage you to go there and take a look. Um, hi, I'm J.R. Huskwood. Uh, my fields are philosophy and religion. Uh, so we get a lot of fake. Uh, I don't even know it's news. It's pretty old, most of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, human beings need uh, credibility. The credibility is necessary because we can't observe everything with our own eyes and ears. Right. If someone uh, makes a scientific discovery, I can't always make it to the lab to check it out. Uh, I'm constantly asking, they keep telling me no. Uh, you know, if something happens in the White House, I can't travel to D.C. to watch it myself. So we have to have some sources, some testimony that we put our credibility, our belief in. Um, and so the question is, what are our standards for credibility? Um, I, I'm going to say that in, in academics, credibility is a matter of exp expertise. Um, and so then we get to the question, what are the standards for expertise? And that is not a question with one answer. Um, there are arguments about what counts as expertise. Um, expertise needs to be lax enough to allow uh, dissent and new voices. So you have a community of experts. Um, it needs to be a loose enough community that uh, people who have sort of 
uh, opinions and perspectives that are new can enter that community and challenge the paradigm. But at the same time, you can't make it wide open or nobody can agree on what counts as better or worse philosophy. Um, so this is, the, this is sort of the landscape that we find ourselves in. We're searching for these relevant uh, communities of experts, uh, and we want to know uh, how can we tell the experts from the non-experts. Um, in religion and philosophy for students uh, in particular, um, you know, I had a professor once who told me that uh, for religion, the internet is where lunatics go to publish. <laughs> um, there's some truth to it. I mean, basically what we've got on the internet is a non-curated, completely open community of voices. Um, but there's very little recognition of expertise. There's no formal institutions to act as a gatekeeper to say, you know, this is a, this is a worthwhile publication and this is not. Uh, furthermore, in religion in particular, um, you have this, this sentiment uh, that's uh, particular to religion that I'm entitled to my own belief. And so if you challenge that belief, uh, well, that's not your right. Um, I think politics is getting pretty close to religion these days, actually, uh, in, in those terms. Uh, I'm looking forward to switching places. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're dealing with all the faith and dogma, and I'm dealing with, uh, I, I don't know what. Um, <laughs> So I, I just want to uh, say that uh, in terms of finding good sources on religion, uh, there are facts uh, and there is good scholarship on religions uh, out there. And for philosophy, there is, and philosophy is even more conservative. Most people don't realize that. Um, they assume that philosophers are all, are all like hitchhiking poets and they just sort of say <laughs> that. Um, but actually philosopher, uh, the culture of academic philosophy is fairly conservative and there are uh, um, very concerned with prestige and uh, have a very sort of narrow community of experts there. Um, it's not monolithic, I mean there is some diversity in there, but it's much narrower than religion. There's lots of good work being done in lots of different spaces. Um, so finding it is difficult, and so if I, if I have practical advice for students, I just refer them to Arlene's guide and say, <laughs> look, look at publishing houses, look at uh, curated databases, academic things. I tell my students, don't go to the, the wild internet, don't do a Google search for anything. Uh, <laughs> As a, as a source unless you sort of use it to get to uh, a peer-reviewed source. That's right. I also just say go to Arlene and Jeremy. <laughs> 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 I'm going to kind of go big picture down to hopefully a couple pieces of advice. Um, a couple big picture points. Uh, many of you are students and the rest are maybe professors like me here, it's kind of who we are here. And people used to come to institutions like this to get access to the facts of the knowledge. And that's just not the case anymore, right? The facts are everywhere. In fact, there's too many facts. And so now our job is giving context and trying to, having a discussion like we're having here. So this is kind of a microcosm of the whole thing, the whole point of liberal arts, really, is what do we do with the overwhelming amount of facts we have out here? Um, and another big picture thing that I think is kind of interesting, if not ironic, is that we are converging on one ideological model for maybe the first time ever in the history of the world. Liberalism, the kind of, you have a new rights, the democracy thing we do with the voting and majority rule, and then we happen to do this capitalism thing with it. But this one model, we're all converging on worldwide. And so it's kind of a weird irony that as we are all starting to share the same basic understandings of life, the things we think are good, we're having harder and harder times agreeing on what the facts are. It's a strange position to be in in some ways. In some ways, maybe it's just we've spent so much time now on the details of it, we find ourselves just as polarized as we used to be when we were communists and capitalists and fascists. Right? Um, so that's some big picture things. And for me and my discipline, there's probably two pieces. One which is boring, but actually fits this talk, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, and then contemporary politics. So as a discipline, political science, like any social science, tries to take these concepts like power or democracy or rights that are not, you can't put them in a petri dish, but tries to look at them in some kind of scientific way. Um, that's not always easy to do, it might not even happen sometimes, but insofar as we can talk in the language of scholarship that has come and been kind of tested over time and speak in those scholars' terms, we're building knowledge somewhere, at least we hope. Um, and so that's from a discipline point of view, we have certain peer-reviewed journals that have prestige and have been tested over time. 
And so those are good places to, to look for the science being done on this weird, fuzzy stuff that we do call politics. Um, and teaching that is one of the things I do, and I see some of my students in here who are in that class right now. Like, how do you, how do you take these weird concepts and make it into an experiment or something you can study? Um, that's kind of the boring side of it. But I mean, as a discipline, we have those attempts all the time. Just in case you thought it's all just made up stuff, uh, kind of, but, but we do have <laughs> people attempting to make it science. Um, but in the study of contemporary politics, like the world we all see, the world we deal with when you go have Thanksgiving and argue with your dad and <laughs> throw the mashed potatoes or whatever you do, um, that is its own fuzzy animal. And in some ways, as social scientists, we have the same problems that hard scientists do, trying to relate what we find to average citizens because it sounds jargony and sciencey, and ugh, I don't want to hear that. So that's one of the challenges we face. Um, but some, some practical advice, I suppose. Something, a piece of advice I share with, uh, last year we had a, uh, a visiting scholar on campus, Richard Benedetto, one of the founders of USA Today. Um, I don't share much worldview with this particular journalist and business guy. But something he said that I generally tell my students is, at the moment, Newspapers, in so far as they exist, that's a good place to start. Mainstream newspapers, still pound for pound, probably your most, most trustworthy journalism. Um, and from there, you really have to go with a variety of sources. You have to take a sample of different things. And as my colleagues have said, you kind of have to find the balance in what you find in those, those various sources. Um, beyond that, there are some political scientists who hope we might once again share some facts. You know, for a while there, everybody tuned into Walter Cronkite, and then you had your set of facts, and then you could go love, I don't know, Goldwater, or do whatever you want to do with your facts, but we were sharing something. Um, so that's hard to get now. You know, it's very natural for us as humans to have selection and confirmation bias where we read and take in the stuff that makes us feel like we were right. And now we have a media landscape that really caters to that. You just go find that one newsletter that tells you you're right, and you go, oh, I knew I was right, I'm so smart. That feels good. <laughs> and the thing you don't like that challenges that, you go, oh, screw that, that's big news, right? Um, so how we ever come to share facts again, not sure. There are some people hopeful that some kind of fact-checking organization will emerge trustworthy in the society and will, will have kind of a new something to do. Um, I'm going to a conference in April with a bunch of political scientists where the whole theme is, how do we talk about truth anymore? And I'm writing a paper with a colleague, it's a little crazy, but it's about maybe how machine learning can teach us how to come to understandings of truth that are different than just a singular person saying, this is true, but kind of a group uh, approach to it. <laughs> but again, this is random theoretical stuff. Where we are right now is, read some newspapers, check a bunch of sources, and deal with your dad without throwing the mashed potatoes. So I'm coming from a different perspective. I teach um, in the PA program, and I teach medicine. I'm a doctor. And I remember something that the dean said on our first day of orientation in medical school. This was in 1992, because I'm a little bit of a late bloomer. <laughs> um, but he said, in the next four years, half of what we teach you will be wrong. We just don't know which half. <laughs> and that really resonated, because I'd been to PA school about 10 years before that. And when I was in PA school, peptic ulcer disease was caused by excess stomach acid and stress. And that made a lot of sense, and we all believed it, and it was kind of clear. But by 1992, it was, it was very clear that peptic ulcer disease was caused by bacteria. And we didn't treat it with bland diets and sedatives, we treated it with antibiotics, which worked better. But nobody would have imagined that in 1982. So I'm in a field where truth changes, which makes this all a little bit harder. So I've got to teach, in, in our discipline, work with our students to identify trusted sources. Medicine is a scientific endeavor. These days, we try to practice medicine based on evidence, meaning based on what's been discovered through um, testing, through studies. 
Um, and I, that means being able to identify what's a good study, what are good methods, um, understanding statistics a little bit. Even though my students aren't going to be going to the primary literature, they need to understand where this information that they're acting on comes from. And then we identify, I think back in the day, 100 years ago, much medicine was based on expert opinion. It was what the professor said. And in some ways, we're coming back to that because medicine has gotten so specialized that decision making often is going to be based on what somebody who really understands this little piece of the um, picture is able to tell us about the research. They can read these studies, understand what's going on, and come up with a recommendation. So there are places to go. There's something called um, the Cochrane Organization that puts out um, reports where they discuss evidence. There's a publication that's a paywall thing called Up to Date, so you can't necessarily get to it on the internet, but it's some place to go. Um, if it's confusing for us, though, how much more confusing is it for everybody else? And so I just want to kind of remind everybody that, that fake news in my field can have really dramatic and long-lasting consequences. So about 20 years ago, there was a publication in a peer-reviewed, very highly thought of journal called The Lancet, where a British doctor presented data that, looked, that showed a relationship between the MMR vaccine, which is given when kids are around one, and autism. And as you can imagine, it raised a lot of concern. People quit giving their kids vaccines. That hypothesis had been there for a few years before that. And it makes sense that um, because autism tends to present in that year where kids are learning language and learning social skills when they're one to two, um, that that's when autism is diagnosed. So lots of concern. But it turned out that he made up the data, essentially, that, that the, the study was bogus. Um, he was, um, it was retracted and he's lost, you know, he's not a doctor anymore. <laughs> I suspect he lives in a cottage somewhere where nobody knows who he is. Um, he's got a flu right now. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what his motive was? This is really interesting. It turns out, after all, after all that was discovered, um, investigative journalists basically discovered that he was paid by plaintiff's attorneys of families with autistic children who were looking to sue pharmaceutical companies. Okay, It's 20 years later, and measles and diphtheria and whooping cough, which are diseases that in this country were virtually gone, are now killing kids again. So fake news has been around for a while. Um, and sometimes it's clothed in a lot of authority. And it has pretty awful consequences. Thank you, everybody. Uh, before we get started with questions, uh, I'd like to say that what we're not going to do is have an angry political dispute about who's getting screwed and who's being lied about. That's not what we're doing. This is an academic environment. <laughs> this isn't cable. So um, we're going to discuss this and have some questions. Uh, but I do want you to ask questions and talk, so I'll stoke you a little bit. In my intro to journalism class and my intro to writing class, my writing one class, and lately it's been all of my basic classes, right? People in my classes. We start out with, I walk in, we look at the syllabus real quick, and then I say, are you media literate? Who here considers themselves media literate? <laughs> okay. Uh, keep in mind, um, if you're in academia, if you're a student, staff, faculty, you're more educated than the general public at large, and you're more interested. So I have students showing up as mass comm majors, uh, a lot of them want to be journalists, broadcast or print, 
And I asked him, so what's the difference? Explain to me what the difference is between local news, national news, and cable news. I have to bust out the... And, uh, well, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 can't get it. Explain the difference between paparazzi and a legitimate news reporter or photographer. Uh, uh, there is a, a very real, um, as well as a theoretical difference between the two. Okay, uh, do you know the difference between a newspaper article, commentary, and op-ed? Well, go ahead, explain it, okay? Uh, most people cannot do this. And as a news person, I deal with this on a daily basis with people watching uh, arguments on cable stations and complaining because the news reporters are just throwing out their opinion. Uh, I, I actually had a, I was very calm and pleasant with this, this woman who said that uh, Mika Brzezinski should be fired immediately. She wasn't doing her job. She, her job is to report the news and just give the facts. And I said, you're aware that Mika Brzezinski is not a reporter. What? I said, Mika is a talk show host. She's a talk show host on Morning Joe. And the fact that she has us talking means she should probably get a raise, not fired. Um, so. The general public doesn't understand what they're, what they're looking at and what they're reading. So this leads to a lot of accusations of fake news. And that's, that's a problem when the accusations are out there that every story a politician doesn't like, whoever it might be, is fake news. Okay? I like to use a lot of sports analogies because I feel like the general public and even our students I feel like it's about 30 years ahead in terms of sports with news because most people don't get interested in news until later in life and I, what I've seen over the years uh, is that people relate to sports much more. So if I said to you today, a couple days after the Super Bowl, yeah, um, did you hear that um, uh, uh, Jerry O'Flynn from the Clam Chowder Times reported that uh, the Patriots are just going to trade Tom Brady. They're done with him, they want to get value and uh, they're going to they're trade him you know, as soon as next week. The response would probably be, who told you that? Where, who's this reporter? Where did you hear that? I've never heard of him. And uh, is it, are they saying that on ESPN? Did Chris Mortensen say anything about it? I, I don't believe you. So then my response is, what well, if that's your response to a, a sports rumor, why on earth did a lot of the general public believe that Hillary Clinton was running a child sex ring out of a pizza parlor? This is, this is real. People believe this, and it made its way. Legitimate news organizations had to respond. This is fake. There, and then a guy showed up with a gun and tried to do what he called a rescue mission to save the kids in the back or in the basement. And there was no basement. There wasn't even a basement in the place. But he showed up, and they're what? But this is real. People believed it. So, with that in mind, what questions do you have? Yes. So, um, okay. So my question is, to what extent does somebody, anybody on the panel could answer this, do you feel as though our inability to make distinctions about credible sources on social media and the internet infiltrates our ability to do the same in academic contexts? Or is the reverse happening? The understanding how to source material academically carries in and informs our ability to negotiate social media. Which is the stronger impulse? That is an excellent question, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have only anecdotal evidence <laughs> from my own Facebook feed. Yes. Um, I'll start with an anecdote. I, was gonna I have a graphic that I was going to show today, and I took it this week as a screenshot from my phone uh, where somebody uh, had posted, uh, uh, the names will, be, will not be given to protect the guilty. Um, somebody had posted a tweet, supposedly from Nancy Pelosi, saying something about how um, it's time for Americans to give their hard-earned money to the people who don't work for it or something like that. Which is not something any decent politician would actually say. I mean, it's just completely unbelievable. So I did what I normally do when I see something that's inflammatory and looks like it's uh, bogus, is I went to Snopes.com. Now there might be a better fact-checking source out there, but Snopes is just the one that I happen to know of. And sure enough, this has been a, a hoax that had been going around, and it gives solid evidence. Uh, namely, in the corner of the image of the tweet, 
there is a watermark from a site uh, that allows you to put the word, it'll, uh, you, you can put words in any politician's mouth and it will generate an image of a tweet as if the politician had said that. Uh, so it was very clear that this was a hoax. And so I just posted, uh, on the, the person who had posted this originally, I commented, it's fake news. And then I put a link to the Snopes article. And I was immediately uh, called a pompous ass um, for falling for that liberal Snopes, which is biased and only good for toilet paper. Uh, and so I took a screenshot of that. I said, this is perfect for our discussion this week. It is. Um, because we now are at a, a, a place of debilitating suspicion, where if, if something presents facts that we don't like, we write it off as um, non-credible, right? So we've, we've sort of lost sight of standards of credibility. And anecdotally, you asked about the connection to the academic. Um, I see a lot of academics not being super picky about the sources that they repost on social media. Um, and I think that this latest election cycle has gotten everyone at least thinking about it. Um, some are quicker than others, but I have seen a lot of things that I, I know are not reputable news sources coming through. Just as many academics, professional academics, as not academics. So just kind of a quick follow-up to that. So, you know, whether it's, you know, I talk about misinformation, which is a mistake, or disinformation, which is um, intentional, kind of like Dr. Morris was saying, um, that disinformation, it, the, the corrections travel much, much more slowly than the original does. So, you know, how many, you know, 25 years later, something like that, we're still, still fighting the, the vaccine, vaccine thing. Or, um, you know, my, my joke about the misinformation was, you know, the, 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 your friend says that the rally gives the wrong date. But it was also misinformation when all those people got a message on their phones that say, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a girl. You know, that's, that's, that was an oops, but that's a big oops. And it took a while before, you know, the, the right information to come. So um, definitely double and triple check your sources before you send something um, for it that you think is really good. And honestly, the more it plays into your emotions and to your point of view, maybe the more suspicious you need to be. Because one thing that happens, especially with Facebook and Google, you can create an information bias bubble for yourself. Because Google learns and Facebook learns what gets your attention, what you click on. And so when you do another search or when you click like, then those sites are going to sh start showing you more of the same thing. And so more and more you see the same sort of information that rather than challenging your viewpoint, it's going to reinforce it. So that's another reason to seek out um, the, the, the newspapers and the databases, things in the middle that are not catering to your point of view. So that's something to be really careful about is um, before you forward information, before you accept it. You know, if you see a, a quote on Facebook that sounds too good to be true, you know, um, probably is. I've been informed that I left you all hanging with the local national cable news and somebody asked me to explain. So, um, I'd like to if all my students could do it. Well, you want to take a shot? Oh, crickets. Um, okay, um, local news is going to give you an inside look out. It is generally very reliable. Um, if you live in, I, I was a news producer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we gave very specific detailed information about bridges, about buildings, about traffic, about the, the Mon Wharf floods all the time. Mon Wharf is flooding, you can't park down there. Why would someone from out of town have any idea what that is? This was very specific information for Pittsburghers. We knew our audience. That's what we were catering to. We were giving local news. Uh, very little of it was politics, uh, very little. National News is going to give an outside look in. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. For example, they have a problem with flooding because the city is surrounded by rivers and bridges. We have the Allegheny and Monongahela come together to form the Ohio River. So Pittsburgh is a triangle with rivers on it and a big river at the end, and we have um, a ridiculous number of bridges. Half of them are one way. If you don't know where you're going, you're, you find yourself on a bridge going out of town, and uh, you're in big trouble. So, 
uh, they're going to give an outside look into what's going on. They will treat issues uh, like uh, policing, uh, the, the relationship police have with the communities um, as an issue that needs to be discussed. Whereas local news has a very symbiotic relationship uh, with local police. They need to get information out through us. We need information from them. We generally get along very well. So I hear people you know, saying, well, the, where, where was the news when this good thing that the, that the police did happen? Um, you know, I can usually find it within, uh, within a minute uh, that the story was done. Um, so it's, it's you know, a very different viewpoint from inside look out, out Inside look out to outside look in. Cable, and I always have to do news, is very little news at all. I call it news programming. Cable is going to be, if you're watching uh, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, they do live breaking news really well. Um, if a bomb hits, if something happens, a building falls down, they will be there live because they've got the money to put people there. And they have a lot of correspondence and they can be live. Aside from that, what they do most of the day is shows with commentators and they have guests either in the studio or on the screen and they argue and they fight about different points of view. Uh, MSNBC is generally liberal, Fox is conservative. Uh, they lean that way. Uh, but it's what I call news programming. It's not giving you news and facts and information uh, you know, at all. It's just discussion. So it, it's very different. And uh, you know, in terms of the idea of, of fake news, journalists making up stories. I wrote thousands, thousands of stories uh, in my time in news and never did I once even, did it cross my mind to make something up. That just seems, it's unbelievable to me that people actually think that's normal. And I can give you examples, but not right now. Um, so, um, Back to Dr. Hausman's opening remarks, you were talking about expertise in your field and how that's required. And I definitely agree, experts are important. We expect our doctors and our lawyers to be licensed professionals. You wouldn't go to one if they weren't. Yet the idea of licensing journalists is increasingly political and doesn't work because we're afraid about who's going to create that licensing, you know. So my question for you is, as scholars, how do we create experts in journalism without creating political biases? I have a few philosophical declarations to make. <laughs> um, first, uh, there is no such thing as non-biased. Um, to be human is to be biased uh, all the way down. Uh, however, we can be uh, self, uh, we can be self-reflective and be biased in more or less dangerous ways. Um, so by being self-reflective, we minimize the impact of that bias. So um, one of the first things that when people come to me complaining that something is biased, everything has a bias. Um, the fact that um, media networks are owned by private corporations gives news a bias. They will never sort of report things that would be damaging to the parent company. Uh, you asked about licensing journalists. Uh, that's a question about how broad or narrow do we want to be as gatekeepers of expertise. Uh, there's a cartoon I was also going to show um, I'll just tell you the cartoons since I didn't show them. Uh, it's a guy in a plane and he's saying, these smug pilots have lost touch with the common people. Who says I should fly the plane, right? Um, <laughs> that's too broad of, a, of an idea. <laughs> uh, too broad of a, a, a definition of a standard of expertise. Now, I want to say something uh, about licensing journalists, and, and I don't know what the future of journalism is. Uh, Dr. Swift might be able to do that. Um, I think. A formal licensing um, uh, procedures um, remind me of, of, of dangerous things, of political suppression and things like that. And that's true of the internet in general. Um, I, I said earlier that I had a professor who said the internet is where lunatics go to publish. And that was 20 years ago. Um, I don't think that that's true anymore. Uh, and I, in fact, think that the future of scholarship, at least I hope, is outside of the current structures of the publishing industry. Um, the current publishing industry model is broken. Um, however, nobody knows what the replacement is going to look like and who's going to be in charge of that gatekeeping. Uh, so that's a really long and fancy way of saying, I don't know, uh, but I hear you, and that sounds scary. Um, fix it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, compared to other uh, parts of the world or other, you know, the way that other international <coughs> entities work, for example, BBC, Al Jazeera,
era, et cetera. Uh, it seems that kind of here in the United States, if you were talking about you know the levels of news, national, uh, you know, local news, national news, uh, we kind of tend to actually lack uh, in the international news uh, department. Uh, and I think you know the the larger the larger entities like CNN, Fox, etc. Kind of started out like that, you know, way back in, in the day. Kind of started out as reporting the international news, but have kind of turned more into, you know, the commentary, op-ed, programming. Uh, do you think? I mean, and I guess it's probably a political science and both a, a media uh, that maybe that lack of reliable international news, you know, rather than you know, international opinions, uh, probably maybe propagates some of this whole, you know, fake news, et cetera? Yeah, that's a, a really good question and a good observation, too. I mean, even if you just compare BBC with CNN, right, maybe half of the BBC broadcast will be international, half native stuff. And it's pretty natural. Now, half of the news in the world isn't happening in Britain, but that's still pretty natural that you want to know what's happening in your country more than others. We just do it to a 97% kind of <laughs> Quite, maybe more than that, really. It's incredible. Of all the different kinds of biases we can claim about media, pro-American, at least content-wise, was undisputed. Um, and I, so, but, but to answer your question of, of is that exacerbating things, I think so. I think Americans have a hard time comparing what we do here with what other countries are doing, which is all the same stuff. We're all on the same model now. We have a hard time doing that. But a larger answer to that question is, um, all right, who do we blame for that? And it's sort of the same answer if you think the media has a liberal bias or conservative bias or whatever the bias you think it is, who do we blame? And we've got two options. It's kind of ourselves or journalists, right? We can say, well, why do journalists show us that? Well, it's for profit. They need ratings to buy ads, so they have to show us what we want to watch. They throw up some international stuff. Nobody watches it. So who do you blame? I guess you blame the market. You blame us. Or you can go the other route, which is equally problematic, and that is, well, journalists, we, we should hold them to a higher standard, and they should just feed us what we need, force feed it to us, because of some professional standard. But good luck being the first one to do that, you're gonna get fired. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting problem for us, whether we're looking at the foreign, foreign policy coverage, or any kind of bias we see is, all right, who do, who's to blame and how do we fix that? Right? Uh, I, can, I can give you a one-word answer, at least in terms of local news, that's where my background mostly is, uh, consultants. Uh, with de through deregulation of, of ownership and corporate expansion, they rely on consultants to tell them what the public wants, and they have research for everything. They know where the audience goes after 30 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half of the story. They can watch the ratings drip, the audience drop off. Um, what the public says they want and what they respond to are two very different things. There was a station in Pittsburgh that had this really cool segment, not mine, not my station, a really cool segment called The World in a Minute, and it was a one minute wrap up of international news. It was really well edited, really well done, ditch it. Uh, they wanted them doing story count of local stories because the, the audience didn't like it. They did focus groups and uh, they, they watched digital ratings. Uh -uh ditch it. So they did one minute of international news and were told to get rid of it by uh, CBS corporate consultants. It's just, it's tough. If I, if I could jump in really quick here, Kevin. Uh, also, the other half of that equation that Chris uh, alluded to is that when it comes to programming, supply also influences demand. So it's not just the public sitting out there and they say, I don't like international news. It's that the, the, what the uh, channels are broadcasting uh, in some sense, shapes their desires and what they do like and their attention spans. Um, Home Depot, there's an interesting, Home Depot sells more beige paint than they ever did before because all of these HGTV shows are decorating homes to look like they should be flipped homes on the real estate market. Now, it used to be people decorated their homes to express their personalities, but now people see these beautiful model homes with beige paint on HGTV, and everyone's painting their homes beige. That's just one example of how 
Um, the supply of information you get and the media you consume influences what you think is your sort of spontaneous demand. You know, oh, I'd like to do this in the dark page. Well, uh, <laughs> I have a cream, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an off-white with a sort of you know, half watermark. Yeah, I have a question. I just wanted to know about um, the news hour. It's supposedly not based for profit, and if you have any opinions about it. I tend to like it. If I, if I am going to watch it, I don't usually watch a lot of news. But um, because it seems to me as if they have both sides, and they have a variety of opinions, and they usually take, they, they've changed, unfortunately, to have more stuff and make it faster. But it used to be a long discussions and, and um, on a certain topic. So I just want to know what the panel's opinion is, if that is a possible yeah. way to... Well, I'll, I'll go real quick and I'll hand off to somebody. Um, that's as a public model for media, as opposed to the for-profit model. And we have a crazily skewed towards for-profit in our balance. And there's pros and cons of both, right? If you get all public, it's Moscow news, right? <laughs> That's the danger. You get too much state sponsorship. Um, but I, I think it's pretty clear for most people that we could use a little bit more public media balancing out the for profit media, probably. Anyone else? Uh, the PBS is a very different model. Uh, they do longer stories, and it's generally. Uh, you know, the people who are, the small number of people who are interested in that type of, of programming that will tune in. Uh, we find that, uh, we call it hyperkinetic, the, the general public is looking, you know, responds more to uh, faster, quicker stories. But there are some of us who like to think and like to watch death. And, um, you know, I love it. But, uh, you know, we're looking at, you compare that to for-profit and they will tell you. And you know, with what uh, Dr. Hostrup <coughs> was, uh, um, was saying in terms of the public responding to what we give them, you'll get no argument from journalists on that. Uh, management and ownership uh, will just stop the foot real quick. So, yeah. back there. Yeah. I was wondering what you think your impact of the new laws um, overturning net neutrality will have, especially within your business. I don't know. <laughs> In my discipline, I really don't. <laughs> it's a very good question. And I, what I, one of the things I was thinking is, um, you know, when it comes in my discipline, which is religion, and nobody cares about philosophy. Corporations don't even know philosophy exists, so I, I don't see that Time Warner Cable throttling philosophy <laughs> websites because they're just too popular. Um, I, I could, I, and, and to be honest, um, private corporations tend to not want to touch religion at all either with a 10-foot pole because it's a highly polarizing topic. So if they take a stance one way or another towards a, a religious organization or a religious website, um, that's that's going to cause them a lot of problems. So that's the only thing I can I can sort of speculate towards is I don't think it would affect my particular discipline much. But just watch; it probably will. Not, but I'm saying that. Yeah. Just I think it's going to push. You know, in in my field, which is already probably too profit based and too commercialized, I think it may push the information balance towards more commercialization and less um, balanced uh, approach to whatever the medical issue is. It, I, Professor, it's a very, good, a very interesting question. And there's a thousand ways I could go, but just take one microcosm. One of the classes I teach is campaigns. And there's a lot of interesting ways that net neutrality can affect campaigning, probably. Although, in terms of politics, that's the place where we have some of the most regulation. So, just as a microcosm, we've got this, we'll see, but that is a really, that's one area I'm really looking at to see what happens with campaign commercials, campaigning, because we're constantly campaigning. So, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a dangerous area, though, I'm sure. Question here? So, how can you tell when something's fake news and just different information? So, like, if you ask different doctors if, bronchitis is contagious, you can get four different answers. Um, and if you, if you um, ask if Christianity was influenced by pagan culture, you'll get four different, probably 4,000 different answers. Um, and so 
what constitutes the right and the wrong when you have different scholarly studies coming up with different answers? You know, does Red Dye 40 affect ADHD? Does sugar affect children? Um, so how can you tell when there's different, <coughs> different viewpoints which ones are right? I'll, I'll take a stab at it, then I'm going to pass it on down. Um, I don't think in some instances that there really is a way to tell if something is right. Because like Dr. Moore alluded to, um, there are some things we think we understand and we don't. And so again, um, I think you have to look at preponderance of evidence. You know, what do most of the, the experts in this field say? Um, use your own common sense. You know, does this make sense with, with how I understand the world and what my experience is? And also a, a healthy dose of skepticism. You know, what, what happens if this isn't true? Um, you know, does this seem like something that's believable? And then you just have to use your own best judgment, critical thinking, um, kind of, you know, sort, sort of tying this into a, a, towards the religion end of things. If, if any, any Methodists in here, um, if I remember the Wesley quadrilateral, you know, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. You use all, all of the, the tools at your disposal to, to draw the best decision that you can. And then it also kicks back to um, what Dr. Hustle was saying about, you know, expertise and, and what are the leaders in the field saying. Uh, really quickly, uh, Christianity was influenced by pagan culture. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just want to make sure everybody knows. <laughs> this could go up in the internet. Just ask me. I have all the authority in the world. Just on Facebook right now. Right. Um, so we have... In religious studies, uh, again, the old joke uh, is, among religion professors is we say, well, you know, in, in PA in classes, you don't have students coming in and thinking two plus two is five and it's their right to believe it. Um, <laughs> but in religious studies, we do. Um, and there, in what we, the reason why in religious studies, the, what we're doing are trying to, you know, let's say if you're trying to get a historical claim about what was going on in early Christianity, there are standards of evidence you can look towards. Um, you can look at uh, what were the texts saying. Uh, a lot of times we'll uh, determine, uh, you know, that we have two different authors of a single text because the grammar changes, um, or the vocabulary changes, or we can look for corroborating texts outside the tradition in religion. So if you want to know about, um, you know, I, there was a professor, I never took a class with him, but he was at the seminary where I studied, uh, who made a whole career out of comparing uh, the Greek Odyssey to uh, an Homeric myth to um, the New Testament, and basically saying that the New Testament story, they were just copying these ancient Greek myths, and there's these you know, subtle sort of patterns. Um, and he had texts that would seem to back that up. Um, so in religious studies, we can look at texts, for example. We can look at grammar, we can look at language. In philosophy, um, now philosophy is really sort of great because we're, we're trying to answer unanswerable questions. So no one can tell you you're wrong, um, <laughs> which is a blessing and a curse because the, the curse is that um, the arguments never end. Uh, but I will say this is that that doesn't mean we don't have standards. And there was a, a great uh, article written by a guy named William J. Wainwright and William Rowe, uh, and they basically say that for any uh, sort of philosophical world, let's say that Arlene over here is, is insisting that reality is by, at its fundamental nature change. And I say, no, reality is at its fundamental nature um, static substances. And we're, and we're trying to uh, you know, argue and convince you all, and uh, half of you are going to go with Arlene, and half are going to go with me. How do you decide between the two of us? Um, well, Roe and Wainwright come up with a list of criteria you can use to determine whether uh, a worldview or a metaphysical proposition uh, is better or worse. And uh, I, I only could think of three right now, but there are like five or six. Um, is this thing coherent with facts we already accept? Right? Is the idea that reality is change? Uh, does that cohere with scientific discoveries we've already made? Uh, does it cohere with itself? Is it internally consistent? Right? If your, if your uh, philosophy sort of falls down and contradicts itself, that's a reason to sort of say we shouldn't look, be listening to this guy. Um, uh, finally, is it fruitful? Does it predict new phenomena? Uh, you know, if I say, uh, you know, if next week we discover that my philosophical predictions come true, uh, then aha, this guy might be worth listening to. Those are three examples of criteria you can use for what we might call uh, 
conclusions that exist outside of um, the scientific method. But there are still standards for evidence there. Uh, real quick, in terms of news, fake news, um, as a, a producer reporter, I did not make claims about anything, nothing. I reported uh, a new article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a new article by a Methodist University religion professor. I'm telling you what other people are doing and what they are saying. They may disagree with each other. I simply report it. And you should look for that in news and for what's, uh, you know, what you want to take. Professor, experts you know, in different fields will all disagree with each other. We simply say what the latest is. So this is a question for you, Dr. Swift. In the Larry Nancer case, Michigan Assistant Attorney General Angela Perales stated that we need investigative journalism now more than ever. How do you think this need for investigative journalism could be hindered or slowed by the fake news? epidemic that we're living in. Do we need more? Um, yeah. no, uh, no, it was investigative journalism that broke that story. And I think that uh, we just keep, uh, need to keep educating the public about what real news is. And uh, with, with good journalism and reporting and investigative work, uh, they'll, they'll come back around. So We're out of time. OK. Um, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's 7.59. Closing, closing <laughs> thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is, right? Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Swift for moderating tonight and also thank all of our panelists. Thank you for participating in the conversation. I hope it continues. And if you're interested in attending any of our other spring workshops, I have a schedule out there for you. So thank you and good night. Yeah, great.